everyone is well. Um, we're at the next to the last chapter. Um, so we're drawing close to the end of this book, and this is our next one, Richard Baxter, uh, that you've selected. And if you've not purchased it, I have more. So you can come and get it. I promised I would check the uh, amount. Does anyone remember what the amount is? <laughs> is Nine dollars. Nine dollars. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. I feel much better now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we'll be talking about uh, chapter um, on quality of corporate worship. Are there any announcements before we before we begin? Yes. Carolyn gave me this. That she found it looks like a bookmark with First uh, Corinthians two five on it. So All right. Anybody may have left it and may be looking for it. Very good. Thanks. Well, I have it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Sally is one. Okay, Sally. <laughs> Lindy Oaks is not here. She usually sits over there. She is accompanying her younger sister who is having baby surgery this morning. Ah, we need to pray for Lindy and her younger sister. Yes, and a real chance to have a witness with her. All right. Thanks. We'll remember that. Yes. Two, two things. Months ago, you might remember, we took up a collection for Keanu or Westside, and uh, she's doing great. She found a job she loves. She's real high spirits, bought a little dog, and so uh, you might, and not the one that had the teeth problem, but the one we, it was even before that, but we, uh, we helped her out with rent. And just want to let you know she's really doing as well. The second thing, I just got back from Florida. Some of you, some of you prayed for that situation. And it went great. The mediation totally reversed the injustices, and so it's that, that's done. And if you have any extra prayer time, uh, <laughs> hey Jim, uh, I'm still dealing with my seven-year mess, and I'd love to see it behind me. But so what's the phrase? God is um, slow, but always on time. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Yeah, exactly. And um, welcome if you've been gone or come here for the first time. And uh, we're glad you're here. And let's pray as we uh, begin. With thanksgiving, with thanksgiving that you have opened our eyes, you have refreshed us with uh, morning good. Thanksgiving, we enter your presence. With petition, we uh, bring before you, Lindy. We thank you for her presence in our friendship and lives and ask that you would visit the conversations, the moments of quiet in hospital waiting areas and room, that her life will become your inimitable advancing instrument of grace. Would you grant great guidance to every medical personnel <coughs> surrounding her sister? And for each one of us, Father, we can stand with John, who has waited a long time, praying, and you have been gracious. We, too, stand and wait in many places. And we bring you praise for the sustaining, keeping grace that you provide. Continue to use John and others here in Kiana's life. Now make our time together your tool, and we welcome you here. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. By the way, if any of you have ever thought about Westside, Jim Sutherland, his 15 plus years or so, has paved the way for respect and openness, and it's, it's, he's the guy to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> to God be all glory, right? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, ask if you turn with me right to the first page of the chapter, 353. And I want to read a section of it and then read a <coughs> quote from another source. Starting with, it is humble. On the occasion of corporate worship, 
God meets with his people. And they find themselves in the presence of the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. As creatures, the deepest humility becomes them. And as sinners, it behooves each of them to cry out, Depart from me, I am a sinful man, O Lord. The worshippers should know that they have no right to draw nigh to God but through the mediator, Jesus Christ. Did not he himself declare majestically, I am the way, the truth, and the life? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He that essays to come to God in his own right can only find him to be a consuming fire. The worshipers should realize that apart from the qualifying grace of Christ, they are utterly unable to worship God alone. Did not their Lord tell them that as the branch cannot bear fruit except it abide in the vine, so they are completely dependent on him for the bearing of fruit. Apart from me, said he, ye can do nothing. That applies also to worship. Um, three comments. One is a quote. One, I don't believe I enter worship with a sense of, uh, that's in these opening words. I don't believe that I enter <coughs> thoughtfully, self-consciously, that I can only come here because of Christ. I don't, I don't believe that's impressed upon me. Um, I, I guess I'd say I just, I'm not mature enough yet that that's present. The second is, is a quote that I've said before. Martin Luther said, the moment I think of Christ and I <clears throat> as two, I'm done. Isn't that a great line? Mm -hmm. The moment I think of Christ and I as two, I'm done. It's the whole doctrine of union with Christ. And Luther was saying, that, that's where I collapse. When I stop seeing myself as in him and him with me, I begin to fray at the edges and come apart. And that's really what he's saying here as you enter worship that I must never think of myself outside of Christ um, and here's I hope this was, is as helpful to you as it is to me <clears throat> because my thoughtfulness about God is uh, it's, it's not trained well often an, an example to the side impresses me more about what I need to understand about him. And this was one from a, one of my favorites that I read some years ago from a book called Mortal Lessons by uh, Richard Seltzer. He's a surgeon and he collected stories of things he had learned from his years as a surgeon. And in this particular case, he had removed a significantly large tumor that was metastasized to the face of a young bride. And to do it, he had to avoid the facial nerve at the risk of, if he cut it, that the whole side of her face would simply collapse. And he couldn't. He just, he couldn't do it. He couldn't remove the tumor without cutting the nerve. And she is now in the room and her husband, new husband, is there. And this is uh, what he describes. <clears throat> I stand by the bed where the young woman lies, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish. A tiny twig of the facial nerve 
one of the muscles of her mouth has been severed. She will be that way from now on. I had followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh. I promise you that. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor in her cheek, I had to cut this little nerve. Her young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to be in a world all their own in the evening lamplight. Isolated from me. Private. Who are they? I ask myself, and he and this wry mouth I have made who gaze at and touch each other so generously? The young woman speaks. Will my mouth always be like this, she asks. Yes, I say. It will. It's because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. All at once, I know who he is. I understand. I lower my gaze. One's not bold in an encounter with the divine. Unmindful, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth. And I'm so close that I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate to hers, to show her that their kiss still works. That's one of my favorite I've ever read. Um, do you realize that the ravages of the fall have made you a less than attractive bride. I'm fond of telling couples who struggle with their marriage. I say, Jesus has been in a lousy marriage since the fall. <laughs> uh, his bride never recognizes nor legitimizes rightly who he is. Um, so there's great hope for you. But you are that lousy bride. And your visage has been horribly distorted. Horribly. And in his incarnation, he adjusted, as it were, the mouth of the groom to kiss the bride. Everything we'll see in the next chapter of husband and wife. It stuns me that he ends with that, incidentally. It just it really has stunned me that that's the last thing he puts in this is the image of bride and groom. But the awe of having had one kiss me in my ugliness um, is lost on me almost immediately in a culture in which corporate worship or private worship is a very me-centered experience. Did I like the sermon? Um, did I like the music? Did they help me worship? And all the evaluation is generally out there. And it's about what I want. And then when I'm alone, what I said last week, private worship and private prayer is by far and above for me, maybe not for you, the hardest part of my Christian life. The hardest part. And I'm, I'm beginning at 66 to see why. It's because it's the most important. It's the place where I'm most fashioned and furthest from who I really ought to be in his presence. And when I'm all alone, all of the, all of the failures, <clears throat> boy, all of the failures of my inner man become, they almost rise up and face me and say, yeah, come on, just try. Let's see how you do with these next minutes. And they're right in front of me. And I feel like I'm in a Disney movie, fighting just to be with him. But this image helps me. This is what you've done for me, Lord. And 
and um, it is good to be with you. Um, I don't know anything about Seltzer as a physician, but it was struck me when I read that paragraph. He said, one is not bold in the presence of the divine. When you see someone stoop like this, it makes you think of the master. So responding to God humbly, or even even a, wanting, even a chapter on, I should adjust my worship to what you want, I think is real foreign to us. I think we just kind of come any way we want. And it's not about, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? But instead it's, what am I gaining from this? corporately or, or privately. And this chapter spun me and took me back to that image. Because I think of myself and Jesus as two more normally. Okay, what's your reaction? Last night I was talking with, studying with a couple of young men and we're talking about this a little bit and said, God is infinite, can't even comprehend that. Eternal, can't comprehend that. The one who created by his word, can't comprehend that. Uh, holy, you know. And then we come to him and uh, excuse me, uh, God, I would like you to do, da, da. Uh, that's really out of place. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very British understatement right there. <laughs> it's more the uh, um, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. The second, if we saw God as a tiny portion of what he was, is, yeah. fall yeah. flat on her face, I'm undone, or depart from me, I'm a sinful man, or, or something. I remember the first time I saw close encounters of a third kind and when they see the enormity of the ship come over the top of El Capitan and they're just all <laughs> really paralyzed. I went, okay, now we're getting closer to what we ought to be. Oh my stars. Uh, just, I am undone. Um, but that, and then you say, well, you know, how, how does one keep that before you. This will sound very, um, it's, the, it's, it's doing the work of repentance with your imagination. It's doing the work of repentance with your imagination. If you'd like to see an example of it, look at Psalm 18 when David is looking back on his life. It's one of the only Psalms that's twice in the Bible. Because it's in 2 Samuel, close to David's last words. Almost word for word, the same. And he's looking back over his life, and he starts describing all of God's deliverances. And he describes, you tore open the heavens. You came down in fire. You split the sea. <clears throat> And I went, you weren't there. That was Moses. <laughs> <laughs> you see what he's doing? He's looking back over his life, and he's putting all that God had done there, though that had never been his experience. <clears throat> but you did. I'm not a fool. I'm not making this up. You did. He's retraining his whole imagination for the truth of God as he looks back. And it takes him to thanksgiving and praise. Um, it's really instructive to learn to repent on the level of your imagination. <coughs> Especially if, you know, you, there's, there's a struggle in, with, between you and the person next to you in worship. Or some controversy that distracts you at church to work at repenting on the level of your imagination. It was not his experience, but it was his inheritance. That's really true. And I think um, I said before, when God keeps saying to Israel, thousands of years after he had delivered them, 
I delivered you. And it gets to this, this one really, I never thought of this. Uh, you know, just the, the, the next section on It's United, holy cavoli. When he said you're not only from the perspective of you and the congregation, that's about as far as I get. But then he talks about the larger church or your denomination, the Christians in your country, and then when he gets to the top of 355, the tr whole truth has not yet been told. The church of all ages worships unitedly. The church of the 20th century joins the church of the past centuries in praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. And the church of the new dispensation joins the church of the old in singing the psalms of holy writ. To see myself at this moment standing unitedly <coughs> and seeing myself as God sees. And that's what David's doing. He's saying, you did do that for me. You knew me when you did that for Moses. Um, he's retraining his imagination. And the bottom of the page before, 354, for instance, a church in America, Australia and Argentina, employing the words of the Apostles' Creed, makes a confession of its common faith in unison. And to explain its experience in Jordan and Lebanon yeah. and Turkey, yeah. Romania and England and Australia <coughs> and the Central Pacific, the one Lord. How did it shape you being in all those places? How did it affect you? Lots of ways, of course, but uh, one of the illustrations I keep remembering is a an Australian couple who was pilots in the Gilbert Islands, which is just beyond the international date line at the equator in the Pacific. Of course. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the remotest parts, the remotest parts of the Earth. <laughs> and as I was walking at the edge of the southernmost island, about exactly ten years ago, I was standing in the Moscow subway. You know, I mean, You've had such a boring life. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you can do when you don't have kids. But I then stayed with this maiden auntie who was the Salvation Army Brigadier General in Cam in Canberra, Australia. And she said, you know, he's different from having been where he is, where he's, you know, one of like two foreign pilots and all the rest are local, and 60,000 people. She said, Any, when he comes home now, anytime anybody says anything that has to do with racial relations, or he is right there because he's lived with them. <coughs> and I still remember sitting learning one of their sitting dances and studying music. And thought, what's wrong, what's wrong with me that I don't look like everybody else? <laughs> and then comparing that with living in England, where I shared a house with four English gals, all souls, playing on place. They looked down on me because I was an inferior culture as an American. And the Gilberts, um, it was a different color <laughs> skin, but they didn't look down on me, and I didn't look down on them. <coughs> um, and then you go to Romania, and the Christian university students were praying, and so united that at the evangelistic camps, with English language or speech, the love just so permeated that you had good believers. And even when I was there, I mean, I'm not, God doesn't use me much for evangelism here, but he did there because of their prayers and their love for each other. Mm -hmm. And just a little something. <clears throat> Some of you have traveled elsewhere and have an understanding of worshiping in the church united. It's much more vivid. Roger, Joy, what are your reflections on that? 
But it's how many at times when you're worshiping with people who don't have the education you do, do not have the sophistication that we do, and yet because they're coming to church, they just endangered their life and family. <coughs> I was having a good time, you know, visiting another country, you know. Uh, and you, you realize that uh, you know, the oneness that we have and also how good it will be to be looking at the back of their heads when we're standing before the throne. Yeah. I, I knew them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But still, the, the oneness, there really is a, a oneness there. That is an extraordinary thing. And, and Talking with Muslim background believers, virtually every one of them had either a vision or a dream that led them to seek the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> yeah, it was so common in Turkey that they, as I've said before, they had a track more than dreams because it was he was doing it so much to get them into the word. <coughs> what are others of you thinking? Well I just had a question probably earlier. What what is the relationship of imagination to conscience? Wow. <laughs> 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 I mean, I think, I mean, that is a very, very insightful question, um, and I'm not sure I'm wise enough to answer. But I, um, I, I really am not. So, well, don't let us get off. The, we were already on something. But, uh, but I think, I think it has a great deal to do with your country. Um, I, I think. The idea of retraining my conscience is more palatable to me than retraining my, my imagination. My imagination. Yes. And that's what uh, brought up. Because <coughs> in the imagination of their minds is a phrase that's not connected yeah. with, with uh, godliness. The thing that I, I, I can see the close proximity, and, and I think that's very instructive. I think. Um, just give an example. I said to a young couple who were very good at legitimizing their own pain in the marriage and were absolutely confident, absolutely sure they were right about that, but had no ability to legitimize the pain of their mate. Um, not I mean, so much so they would talk about them um, in the third person, they, in their presence. They would not talk to them. They wouldn't look at each other. They'd become so proficient. And when I said, why have you ever worked at legitimizing the pain of the other? And they said, we don't even know what that means. <coughs> And I, I said, one of my greatest concerns is I need to pray for the gift of repentance to be given to you. Because you're clueless that you hurt more over what hurts you than what hurts him. And what hurts him is that this relationship is so broken, you're just living side by side and don't know how to do this. <coughs> And there's no sadness. <coughs> That's very sad. That you're not sad. And that connects the imagination to the con they couldn't even imagine hurting for the other. It was like I was from another planet as I said that. Um, but it was important <coughs> that they see that they had normalized their mediocrity. They had standardized and rationalized and justified <coughs> instead of <coughs> rightfully vilified what they were doing to one another. And saying conscience 
rather than imagination actually is quite instructive. Don, yeah, you may, may I add to that uh, to what you said? <coughs> if you compare with the water and the steam when you boil the water, if the water is compared to conscious, which is a permanent structure embedded in your heart, and if you boil it, the steam comes up. All that's, <coughs> that's imagination. Mm -hmm. And you have all different forms, starting from your consciousness. Mm -hmm. But once the imagination goes out in the air, it gets contaminated <coughs> by the air pollution. You get back into the water again. So if you think about it that way, it might, it helps me to I interpret those two vocabularies. Mm -hmm. What about ice? <laughs> <laughs> ice is another form of water. <laughs> That's more my conscience right there. Don, Don you have your hand? Yeah, uh, regarding the issue of repenting when we should be imagining, when that imagination, our imagination, is being directed by the Word of God, mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking of that. It's really the very last paragraph under It Is United <coughs> after the <coughs> to cap the climax the worshipping church may be said to have come to Zion and unto the <coughs> God the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels and the spirits of just men made perfect those three verses Hebrews 12, 22-24 are our attention <coughs> was first directed to the Theology Conference and, and Robert Godfrey was speaking and it was really a worship service and he was saying, now imagine yourselves like a launching pad. Physically, you're going to remain in the pews but your spirit, according to these verses, is going to ascend into the heavenlies. You are going to be in the presence of Christ of the church of the firstborn, you're going to be in the presence of spirits already made perfect and all this. And it just seemed to be too fantastic. But I don't know Greek, but I know you have come is the perfect indicative active. Indicative, it is a statement of fact. A perfect is something that's happened in the past and continues in the present and in the active voice. And so here it is, God is making a statement. Do I hear his voice in that statement? And even though I can't understand it, am I willing to believe this, that every time I worship, and other theologians, you know, we've read and such, can certainly agree with this, it actually occurs in heaven. Dr. Clowney would say all true worship occurs in heaven because that's where Christ is. So will I let my imagination by faith really receive what the scripture is saying? And the practical benefit of this, I think, is since that time, you know, I don't do it every Sunday, but if I just reflect on this, if I say I'm going to be in the presence of Christ, I'm going to be in the presence of all those who have died in Christ, it makes worship and the, and the wonder of our salvation just more real to me if I can accept by faith what is being said in these verses. That's why Ephesians 2 says we're already seated with Christ in the heavenlies. That's why Philippians 3 says we're already citizens of heaven. It's because we've been there. <laughs> we repeatedly go there, and it is a great privilege of our salvation. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I had a pastor who, shortly <coughs> after he came, began something that lasted the whole time he was our pastor. He, he reminded us frequently, we are not worshiping in, in this building. We are lifted up by faith to the heavenlies where we worship. And it was, to me, it was a new new thought. And I asked him for, for some scriptural basis for that, and he pointed to that passage as well as, as some others. And then as, as we were singing, the God of Abraham praise, that mm -hmm. hymn, if you know that hymn, next time you sing it, notice how many ways that hymn talks about from earth 
to from heaven to what? I can't remember how it goes. I rise mm -hmm. to, but notice the phrases in several stanzas that point that out. Mm -hmm. Both of your both of your comments are really helpful. Mm -hmm. Really, really helpful. When I uh, was reading these two chapters on, on worship, uh, I couldn't get away from the thought of marriage. Mm -hmm. You know where you know two people are two people, but when they become married, they become one, and it's a covenant, it's a binding agreement unto death, and then when we bring the whole church into it, and we think about the Holy Spirit that dwells in each and every one of us in this room, we become not just a bunch of people, but we're one, mm -hmm. because we're all married to mm -hmm. the yeah. same, you know, uh, to the groom, yeah. we're married, and so what's his is ours, and so there's a bonding. Just like when we were talking about meeting people that you have never seen before. Mm -hmm. Just like uh, we had a, a cookout on uh, Sunday after last, and this lady that goes to the church, she goes to the second service, I go to the first service. Never met her, but she, we go to the same church. But when we uh, came together as a group, you know, we were sitting at the table, and me and my wife was talking to her, she's from the Congo Republic. And, uh, and it was just a bonding, like we knew her from, you know, because of the spirit that's within each and other, each of us, and we were one. Last week, I had mentioned that uh, the, week, the week before that I, when I left here, I feel closer to heaven than I ever felt before. And God reminded me this week I'm 66, and my dad died when I, he was 67. And my mother died when she was 67, and they were eight years apart in age. I feel like <clears throat> I don't have time to procrastinate. Uh, I don't have, I don't feel like I'm about to die, but, but now is just not the time to procrastinate about the things of God. So I, I feel His presence, and 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 I need to, I need to be listening, and move when He say move, on sharing the gospel because there's opportunity. He present opportunities to us every day, and I can't afford to to let them pass. It's helpful, it's, it's sad that we have to have a sense of our finitude made clear to us as we age instead of a sense of our finitude all the time. Like, it just, it's just sad about our culture. <clears throat> it's just part of, the, part of the marks of our culture that when you're young, you think you have forever, and you don't. Yeah. And, um, but the compression of your sense of finitude as you age <coughs> heightens your sensibilities um, to what ought to be. Like what you're both talking about, Ron, the us, the we ness of the kingdom um, matters more to me now than it did when I was younger. The me ness of the kingdom mattered more to me when I was younger. But the fact that I'm part of a we really impresses me now like it never did. Um, that I am part of the largest work. It feels bad calling it the largest organization. I'm part of the largest movement that ever will exist. And it will make all things new. And he is doing it put me in it. How did I ever get in this thing? Um, just thrills me like never before. The we, and it can come down to when you're sitting with a person from the Congo Republic or you leave a meeting where you're with a whole lot of people that are not like you. Um, and it helps. It, it, let me just look at the, the section on it's spiritual. I was struck on 
355 to the query of the Samaritan woman, which was the proper place of public worship, Mount Zion, the holy place of the Jews, or Mount Gerizim, the holy place of the Samaritans, Jesus replied, The hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The phrase in spirit does not refer primarily to the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, but to the spirit of the worshiper. Paul used similar expression when he said, God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit. Yet only he will truly worship God in his spirit, whose spirit is controlled by the Holy Spirit. I think that's, that's again, we are so, we're so physical, and it's not wrong to be physical, but we're physical to the exclusion of understanding our inner selves. Um, and I, I'm very instructed by Psalm 42 and 43 when the psalmist prays, Why are you downcast, O my soul, spirit? Why are you so disturbed within me? And the word for disturbed, you can find translated elsewhere, roar. The sound of a storm roaring. And when I saw that, I went, okay. I identify with that. That inside, it sometimes is so loud, it's difficult to hear. And to be able to say, God, calm that inner storm so it is less distracted and more attentive. Calm it, please, so that it is aimed at honoring and praising and knowing you. Maybe your spirit is more cooperative than mine. Um, maybe you got a puppy, but I got a Doberman. And it is with mean as a snake um, and very noisy always scratching at the door for less than edifying way. Joe, can I ask you some question? It's maybe not a straight answer possible, but when you when we begin to pray, often we verbalize, we speak to God, we try to concentrate and then get into unison with the Lord. And then you ended up listening his voice at the end often, just like the Daniel did, and how do you discern at that time, it is the voice from the Lord, or is it the voice from my own inner skin? How do you discern those two? You know, because of my fallen nature, and I have a certain desire, certain prayer wants to go in a certain direction. Even though you try to surrender, submit to Lord's will, still there's a very deep down in the abyss of my heart where I cannot see. I have inclination to hang on to that desire. And how do you discern this is the words from the Lord or is it from my own inner skin? How do you decide, Joe? You're asking me. Yeah. <laughs> You're not asking us. You. Yeah, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't, I'll answer for me, and some of you may be much yeah. more able. Two words immediately came to my mind, yeah. biblically and humbly. Um, but if it doesn't square with the word, I immediately back away. If I, I just, because I don't trust myself. And I tell him, Lord, I just, I don't see this. I, I, I can't. I don't see this in your word. And the other is humbly. I can't count the number of times I said, I think, I think I'm understanding you. When I get to heaven, I'm going to check. <laughs> but I think this is what I ought to do. <coughs> and keep that humility. Then sometimes in providence, the flourishing of his honor will come, and I will then say, I think I got it right this time. Thanks be to God. Um, I, 
I'll, I'll keep working on it. But those are my two. I, I don't, I don't live with a lot of certainty that I've. I'm, I'm sure I got it now. And very frankly, it's part of the reason I'm a Presbyterian. <clears throat> I believe if I get in a room with brothers who have vowed to keep their consciences bound to the Word of God, I'll give it my best shot. But if I'm an idiot, somebody tell me. I feel much safer in that context. Um, to try and serve his bride because um, I don't I don't trust myself if it is a, some theological issues I can understand that but if it is a God in the Bible for, I can give you an example for example we, we shared this before so I can share it now because it's past we can look back and we can share it <coughs> when we were praying for Ralph Hill, for example, and uh, there was no medical data to support what I had to do for him. And the, the word I'm hearing is, do it. And I didn't know whether that was his voice or my own internal scheme of a scientific mind trying to figure that out. So that's why I use the word peculiar urge when I talk to you, <laughs> prospectively, not knowing, is that me or is that you? Mm -hmm. I keep getting away from his voice, looking back, praying, I hear it, and run away, trying to do yard work with the power tools to just get away from mm -hmm. it, I hear it again, over two weeks. So finally I surrendered. Those are not in the Bible, Joe. So I, you remember when you called? Yeah. You said you did you did something else that I would recommend. Yeah. You principalized yeah. the scripture to apply to your choice, and you almost at the beginning of the, of the conversation you said the ox is in the ditch. Yeah. <laughs> and I went, what? <laughs> uh, you remember? Yeah. You remember we saying? talked about the area. Yes. And because you were You were in Seba. That's yes. why I didn't want to bother you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you, you also, you did the very thing that I talked about. You sought communal <coughs> support, should I, yeah. my thinking straight. There's part of the reason I <coughs> I rarely make large decisions alone. I rarely. If I'm thinking I'm being prompted to do something, I can't remember the last time I just called that shot and said, this is God, I'm going to do it. Yeah. yeah. Whew. Man, I'm calling somebody and yeah. saying, does this, does this seem right? So you principalize, there's wisdom in many counselors. And you did that, whether it was conscious or not, you did that. And I said, I think you should go ahead, but humbly. Because you asked, is this God? I said, yeah, I'm not sure. Go ahead, humbly. Let's see. And you did. And Ralph was healed. Mm -hmm. Bill, can I uh, yeah. address that? Um, uh, in our healing ministry, uh, we always pray and ask the Holy Spirit to show us or what might be a contributing factor with, with the problems that people have. And a lot of times, uh, like you're saying, we don't know if it's just our own minds or if it's the Holy Spirit telling us you know, something. And uh, in one case, so we had this uh, girl in 10th grade who had scoliosis, and, uh, and one shoulder was higher than the other, and, and uh, one leg was about an inch and a half shorter than the other. And so we had prayed, you know, Lord, show us, you know, what, what might be the problem here. And um, we asked, uh, when did this start? She said in seventh grade. And she'd been to every specialist imaginable. And so uh, uh, we said, were you in an accident, uh, some sort of sporting injury? She said, no. Uh, and here's where the Holy Spirit you know, speaks. My wife. First question she asked is, have you ever played for the Wii before? Now, where in the world did that come from? <laughs> well, it turned out that she had. And uh, she and we asked when. She said, well, I guess it was sixth or seventh grade. 
And uh, of course, as you all know, Ouija boards are you know, invoking evil spirits basically to give you hidden knowledge. And uh, so we, we told her you need to repent you know, of that. And uh, she did. And then we prayed for, for the lakes that even out. And instantly in front of our eyes, they evened out. And we prayed for the scoliosis for her spine to be you know, straightened out. And instantly before our eyes, her spine was straightened out. And, uh, and months later, we contacted her and healed everything that was properly aligned. And so the, the issue is that that was the root problem that opened the door for demonic oppression on her physically. Uh, when she was playing with that Ouija board. And we would never in the human realm have guessed that mm -hmm. that was a problem. But because we'd asked the Holy Spirit to show us, my wife was led to ask that question. And uh, we only knew after the fact that that was the Holy Spirit leading. You know, uh, we, we don't know before the fact oftentimes, but I think with experience, when you see that happen over and over again, that you're, you're able to understand, yeah, this is the Holy Spirit leading you know, us in this direction. Then I think your patient had a sudden onset of scoliosis, not born with it. I right. think you yeah. mentioned that it yeah. suddenly developed, yeah. yeah. I think conformed to the scripture, not knowing until afterwards, um, and that's very important. Um, but I think that would be my my little boy's answer. This is prior to that, but I have never forgotten from the early 60s hearing a Christian doctor in Indianapolis saying, how do you solve that? Look at the problem. He said, first of all, you state the problem. If you, have to, if you know it. And then you state biblical principles. Then you apply the principle and commit it to God. Now, that doesn't really answer your question, but it gives a framework for approaching questions. State the problem. State biblical principles. Well, of course, that means you need to know the scriptures well enough to know what kind of principles might be relevant. Apply the principle and commit to God. Mm -hmm. I found it very helpful. Thank you. I think, too, <laughs> that um, part of the reason I, don't, I think we can't just kind of tuck it all down, do this and you'll always know, yeah. is because it's a relationship. Yeah. I think he defies that. I think he opposes that. Because once I figure that out, then I stop relying on a person. I rely on the formula. And that really... That basically is petting the cat from the tail to the neck. That's doing the exact opposite of why I was redeemed. I've been redeemed to depend upon a person for everything. And if I've got mental clarity, I'll stop depending upon the person. Lord, am I right? Instead of living this constant state of, the moment I think of you and me as two, I'm done. I have to depend upon you. I don't have a choice. I often think of the verse, without faith it's impossible to please yeah. me. Almost he structures life to demand faith. Imagine that. Of <laughs> 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 yes. course, I like logic and reason. Exactly. <laughs> Back to um, what Will had said about conscience and imagination, and also what we're talking about, which I think all relates. I think it all relates. Um, I remember one time I was at um, a uh, conference for the Spiritual Formation Bible put out by Renovare, which is uh, Richard Foster, Dallas Willard, and a few others. And um, there's this, this breakout session that I was in by a guy named Sun Young Tan, who is a... Uh, uh, a psychologist and a minister but anyway he was talking about sanctified imagination and <clears throat> how it's important to submit our imagination to God because that's part of us 
And um, immediately, when, I, when he was talking about that, well, not immediately, but I mean, as he was talking about that, I felt this fear in me. Like, wow, what if I'm deceived? What if, I mean, sanctified imagination? What, I mean, but how do you know? And stuff like that. I felt this fear. And, um, but I did submit my imagination to God at that time. And, and, and since then, have tried to do that. Because it's a, you know, God wants us to love Him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And um, and what I realized though, later on, is that I think as I'm as I'm I'm realizing that um, I think that was the enemy trying to get me not to submit my imagination to God. And and it reminds me of that verse in Second Timothy. I think it's Second Timothy, where it says, "God has not given us a spirit of fear." But a spirit of, but a spirit, capital S spirit, I think, of power, love, and and self discipline, or a sound mind. And um, so, part of me, part of my process for listening to God's voice, trying to, is all the things that is the things you're talking about, but also is it is it producing fear in me, or is it producing love? Or is it have is that is fear attached to it or is love attached to it? And it's it's subtle because like what Sunday and Tan was saying, I think was right and was probably loving. But what I was sensing, not from him but from myself, was fear. It's probably because I had um, a problem with um, my imagination being not submitted to God and everything. But um, <coughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is that love. A, a love of God and a love of others will always be a part of the sanctified imagination. And that connects, to me, that connects conscience and imagination. You know, love and, and, uh, and imagination. So what does that mean, Con submit my imagination to God? To me, you mean? Well, uh, to me, it means, um, like it says in. <clears throat> All right, so my my imagination is part of me, I assume, right? And in James it says, "Submit yourselves to God. Uh, resist the devil. Submit yourselves to God. I, you know, and He will lift you up, or something like that." It says that. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. He'll flee. Yeah, yeah. And but but the first part is submit yourself to God, and um, to me that is. That's the whole Christian life right there. It's a very simple way to do the Christian life is to just submit myself to God according to his word, you know, according to um, his presence, and then resist the devil. And um, those, if I do that, I find a lot of peace. And I notice that it's a lot easier to live with God. And, and my imagination is a little more free to worship him, not like images <clears throat> in my mind, like you know, because we're afraid of worshiping images in our minds as Presbyterian, because we're, uh, um, we're we he says don't worship images, worship me, you know. But I don't think that means that you can't have a sanctified imagination. I think that you know, as I submit to God, um, I might notice things in my mind changing. I don't remember exactly which book we, what it was from, but one of the books we read in this class says imagination is most untamable human function of our mind. Most untamable. <laughs> and I think you may be a little bit mixed with the conscience and the imagination when you describe and submit yourself to God. You probably mean submit your heart or conscience to God, yeah. not imagination, because that imagination is almost untamable. Well, if you, bo if you boil the water, steam goes out. Yeah. If yeah. you put in a pressure cook too much, it'll explode. I agree, uh, I, I like your illustration, you know, but I would submit that when I, can, when I have a war going on in my imagination, it's probably because there really is a war going on for my mind. Wait. And, uh, 
I've yeah. got one sentence I just have to share. 359, just above, it is festive. It's under, worship is beautiful. Last sentence, in short, beauty in worship is the reflection of holiness. So what we're looking for is holiness. And God uses the beauty to reflect it. Beauty being part of the imagination. But if it's reflecting his holiness, that's terrific. We're going to have to stop. We'll come back. We have one more chapter. And when we get to the last chapter, um, we'll either, you tell me, do we do the whole book next week or just do the last chapter? We usually do the, the, the next chapter, and then the next week we do the whole book. All right. Yeah. That's what we'll do. Yeah. All right. So we'll just do the next chapter. Um, let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Father, I think of John Bunyan, both because of apparently when and where you shaped the way he thought of you in a jail, and the fruit being Pilgrim's Progress. For many of us, having read it while we gathered here, just seems he was so filled with scripture. Fill us similarly. And even as this chapter is said, according to your law, so that we will kiss back, rightly responding to you with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The cups for the kids are in the back as always.